Uh, Dr. Sunny Nakai, uh, our session name today is, quote, overrepresented, end quote, in medicine. Let's talk about it. Um, I would uh, love to have you tell the audience a little bit about yourself and then jump right into the topic. Um, I know you as the former dean of UC of Riverside and now currently at, um, oh gosh, Cal Sciences, right? Um, California University of Science and Medicine. Mm -hmm. Thank you, California University of Science and Medicine. I'm a little flustered with my back-to-back -back sessions. I'm losing my speech. Um, so I've known you for a few years now. I'm always super, super impressed by what you have to say. Some of our students here remember, may remember you from last year. I think you talked about choosing a school list and that session was a giant, giant hit. Um, so I know today is a different topic and I'm excited to see what you have to bring. And uh, I'm gonna hop into the background so this is mostly your show, but if you need anything, I will be here. All right. Thank you. So I'm happy to be here. I'm Dr. Sunny Nakai. I'm a Senior Associate Dean for Equity, Inclusion, Diversity, and Partnership at California University of Science and Medicine. Um, I have been doing equity practice and diversity inclusion for about 20 years, since before it was sort of all the buzz. And I wanted today to engage you in an uncomfortable and difficult, but really necessary, critical, important conversation about um, representation in medicine. Um, I see in some of the forums that this term overrepresented is used, and I think that there's a lot of misunderstanding around what the landscape looks like and where we're from. So whenever we have these contextual conversations about representation, I think it's important to look back in history. So I'm inviting you to this difficult discussion with me. If you're not up for a difficult discussion or for learning maybe a few new things that you weren't uh, sure about before, uh, it, I, feel free to bail. That's okay too. Um, but hopefully you'll stick around and we'll get through this together. So I'm going to share my, my slides, my screen here. Um, we're going to go with screen two. Here we go. So hopefully everybody can see that now. Um, we're going to be using Slido today. Um, so I really want to talk about the history of allopathic medicine in the United States. You may not be aware of that. And of course, we're going to lean into some of this discomfort um, in order to advance justice. I'm hoping to inspire you to be a change agent as you come into medicine and join this profession and help you understand the responsibility that we all have for diversity, equity, and inclusion work um, at our schools. So uh, this is the Slido. You can scan this code with your phone. It will put you right into the a poll, or you can go to slido.com in another tab on your computer or tablet and enter this code PREMED21, and that's how you can join the poll today. I'm not collecting this data or information. It's really just meant to be interactive so that we can all see what each other are, are thinking and doing. So you're completely anonymous. Feel free to, to speak freely. Um, as we get into this conversation, I can see folks are joining the poll. I want to begin by thinking about how proximal have you been to racism in your life so far? Um, and that is, if we think about racism as a campfire, how close have you been? Have you sat around it your whole life? You feel like you've been shaped by it. You feel like it throws sparks and burns you constantly. You, have you seen people be consumed by it? Maybe you just see the smoke from the hills. You know that there are people who sit around campfires, but you're not really one of those people. And we have to reflect for a second on our engagement and proximity to racism and what our personal experiences have been as a way to kind of set the tone for engaging in this, in this conversation. So I'll give a few more people an opportunity to join. Let's just see what some of the responses have been. Okay, so some of us feel that we've, we've witnessed it and we've supported others, but we have not been directly impacted. Um, a little bit of experiencing it a few times. Um, all the way to you know, experiencing it regularly and having our life shaped by racism or it hasn't impacted us much, right? And other people's racism or the fact, the racism impact on us, that's something that we have to be really aware of. I think our thoughts and learnings and approaches definitely are shaped by our lived experiences. So you can continue to join the poll. Um, I ask you to kind of reflect on this as we move forward into this discussion. So how would you describe the conversations that you're having about race right now? So this will be a word cloud. Um, feel free to put in as many words as you'd like, but how would you describe conversations that we're having about race? 
in medicine, in the pre-med context, on your social media? What, what words would you use to describe those conversations? Are they easy? Are they hard? Ooh, touchy, yeah. Surface, right? Like we don't, we don't get into the nitty gritty, we don't go deep. We avoid vulnerability at all costs, right? Like um, it tends to be sort of off limits, um, SES or disadvantaged, eye-opening, okay? Some people are having some eye-opening conversations, intense, challenging, confrontational, divided, afraid that being a model minority or Asian isn't enough, confusing, okay? Silenced, one-sided, sure. You have to believe or think what I do or I'm going to cancel you, right? A lot of denial, uh, stereotypes, um, transformational, that's a good one. Necessary, but exhausting. Sure. So yeah, we, we are having conversations about race across this entire spectrum. And I think it's, it's definitely challenging um, to sort of figure out where do we fit in in these discussions based on our lived experience in a way that honors ourselves, but also leaves space for new learning and support for our colleagues who are maybe have different experiences with racism and different proximities. So um, very good, um, our word cloud, challenging, confusing, necessary, and difficult. All right, so let's let's trudge on here. So I, I'm curious to know if you think that it's easier for underrepresented minority students to get into medical school, because this is something that comes up on forums quite a bit. And having been an admissions dean, um, and if you if you've seen my book, I write a little bit um, about this in my book to try to touch on some of the challenges with representation um, and the pools and whatnot. So I'm interested of sort of what are the perceptions out there about whether it's easier for underrepresented minor minority students to get in. Okay, so we have uh, across the board, people are sort of not sure, somewhat true, completely false. Okay, so I'm going to ask you to consider this again, or ask you to consider this within a much larger context of the conversation we're gonna have um, at the end of this. And hopefully the perceptions that you currently have might change or shift, or if they don't change or shift, the larger context for some of those things um, will be more uh, apparent to you. So, okay, so overall we think that it's, uh, it's, yeah, somewhat true all the way through to completely false, right? So thank you for your participation. Again, if you're just joining us, you can scan the QR code and, and join the poll at any time. And all of your responses are anonymous. We're not keeping them. Um, I just do this as a way to kind of engage you because we're in virtual conference land. So rather than being all in a, in a room together and raising our hands, um, we have the option of, of doing polls. Okay, so I wanna talk about this oppression, discrimination, and racism. Um, just to challenge you to think about, you know, what is your place in DEI initiatives in life so far and in medicine? Have you engaged in these things as a means of sort of preparation? Have you lived this story and are living in it and really want to advance this? Um, what does conscientious and inclusive engagement look like, which is, leaving space for us to be our authentic selves, but also still creating space for our colleagues who have different challenges than we do um, in these spaces. And if you're aware of these um, forces in your community or institution, why or why not? And how can we make our own experiences and engagement visible while still leaving room for our colleagues? So consider these intersections of identity that really kind of uh, overlap in different forms of oppression, racism, discrimination, sexism, homophobia, all these things. So all of us have identities across these different domains that impact how we've gone to school so far, ways that we've um, engaged in healthcare, our own pre-med journeys. And so um, each of these intersections and different combinations exists for each one of us. So the key is really to use your empathy to find common ground with other folks who might be experiencing some of the same challenges. So a little secret about DEI and MD admissions and medical education in general is that we don't agree, right? So all the things that you said about these are touchy topics and we only hit the surface, all of those things apply to those of us on the other side who are having these conversations and trying to advance these ideas. Um, there's tension within population parity arguments and between groups around, should we be really using race as a justification here? Is that fair to people that we're bringing in to say, you're only allowed to come into medical school because there are all these underserved communities that you're expected to go to, whereas everyone else can choose subspecialties that are much more lucrative that don't have as much community demand, right? We can't solve all these problems with diversity alone. So representation, which 
we're sort of never going to catch up. But representation is not going to be enough to solve these problems. Putting people in the room is not going to change some of the structures. So race is not really a risk factor in health, but racism is. So what is our responsibility to think about the history of racism in medicine and how it has created the representation challenges we have, risk factors, things like that? So we're gonna do a pop quiz. Again, this is not graded. Um, this is not gonna go on your transcript. So um, feel free to engage the questions um, honestly and fully and no Googling and cheating, right? I'm gonna to try to go through them fast so you don't have time to Google this information. But we're gonna talk about some history um, in medicine. So you can join the quiz. You can have whatever name you'd like. Um, I think I can show the leaderboard sometimes, but maybe I'll just show at the very end. So you could be your initials, you can be super person, um, superhuman, anything that you'd like. So feel free to join the quiz and then we'll get started. I'm gonna ask you some questions about the history of allopathic medicine. We're gonna look at today's representation, um, do some historical events that are not very long ago and hopefully broaden the perspective that you have um, about the profession that you potentially will be joining. Okay, so we have some folks joining. Awesome. Oh, happy tree, I like it. Anon, very nice. <laughs> okay. Looks like there's still some folks getting in. Again, you just scan the QR code and you'll be, you'll be dropped in. And you answer these on your phone or on the tab that you have open on your screen. All right. So the Flexner Report, which established accreditation standards for allopathic medicine was published in what year? 1893, 1902, 1910, or 1919? You're on the honor system not to cheat. This is probably an easy one to Google, but they're going to get harder, so don't worry. All right, let me give you like 10 more seconds to choose your answer. I think we had around 45. All right. Okay, so this is what everybody voted, and the answer is 1910. So over 100 years ago, we established these standards, and actually a lot of the pre-med requirements that Flexner outlined have not changed. All right, there's our leaderboard, super fun. The consequences of the rise of allopathic medicine out of all the different types of medicine that existed at the turn of the 19th century were to standardize, regulate licensure, and professionalize the, the the overall organization. So there were botanists and Tonsonian physicians and chiropractics and bone setters and all sorts of people. And they could all hang up a shingle and say that they were doctors and it was not regulated. And so the goal of, of this was to sort of say, here's the education that you have to have. This is what makes you a doctor or not a doctor. A lot of it was to push out fraud, but a lot of it was interested in um, securing good competition to create a life of the trade and to make medicine much more profitable. Because if anybody can be a doctor, how do consumers discriminate against who's a good doctor and who's not? And how can we charge more for our services if everybody is doing it? Okay, so here's your next question. What percentage of practicing physicians in the United States were women in 1950? What do you think? 2%, 6%, 10%, or 18%? What percentage of practicing physicians in the United States were women in 1950? The Flexner Report actually was a review of every medical school, supposedly every medical school in the country, to look at their facilities, their teaching, um, overview of their methods. And then they subsequently each year published medical education reports about each medical school, almost like the first kind of version of some crude U.S. News and World Report type thing. And these are seen in the, in the archives of the Journal of the American Medical Association, the JAMA archives. Okay, so we have a pretty close tie between 2% and 6%. In fact, it is 6%. So it's really not that long ago. And I think one of the reasons why, let's look at our leaderboard. Okay, great. SB, you're in the lead. One of the consequences of the rise of allopathic medicine was segregation, restriction of opportunity, and to make medicine elite. And so that meant that most of the schools that trained women were either dissolved into larger schools or were completely closed. So opportunities for indigenous people, um, for, for 
Blacks and for those who were in rural areas that trained under apprenticeship models, these all closed. So while the professionalism and the standards and the safety of medicine improved, the restrictions and the elitism of medicine really began with this. One of the things that it did was require undergraduate college. And so who had access to undergraduate college in 1910? wealthy, cisgender, heteronormative, white, elite, landowning men, or the progeny of folks who had come from families as such, right? So, so this is a challenge that we are actually baked into the structure of the start of allopathic medicine are these three principles of elitism, restriction, and segregation. So a statue honoring J. Marion Sims, who was considered the father of obstetrics and gynecology, he experimented on enslaved black women. It was removed from the New York Academy of Medicine grounds in what year? So it's a big bronze statue honoring this person who um, kept enslaved women in cages in his lab and did surgical experiments on them to try and further some of the treatment um, modalities to cure certain conditions that created complications in childbirth. And while you're voting, I'll tell you that one of the motivations for Dr. Sims was the fact that the um, importation of more slaves was banned in, in, um, in the United States. And so slavery was still alive and well, but the only way to get more slaves was through childbirth. So a big motivation of Dr. Sims to experiment on Black women was to ensure that they could survive childbirth and that their children could survive childbirth so that we could continue to reproduce more slaves. So even some of the motives of these medical advancements are rooted in oppression. Um, and that is, you know, that's, that's part of historical fact. Okay, so we have some votes here. Um, yes, the answer is, is 2018. All right, Shinanu, you're in the lead. So this is a, a, a picture, a painting that really kind of almost aggrandizes this experimentation. This is um, Lucy, Betsy, and Anarka. They are the three women, um, according to Dr. Sims' journals that he kept first-person journals of his experiments um, about these women. And this is, this is very um, dispassionately, right, showing uh, what, this, what this experimentation uh, looked like. The statue uh, came down uh, as women protested. They're even thinking of changing the name of some of the tools, obstetrics tools that are named after Dr. Sims. There are certain types of retractors that are, um, that are named after Dr. Sims that are used for exams. Um, so we have to really acknowledge that the history of, of medicine and advancements in science includes injustice for indigenous black, brown, poor, and non-male bodies. And I think that's an important acknowledgement um, to be making as you're moving into this profession. All right, next question. The first black owned and operated hospital opened in Chicago in what year? So what year was the first black owned and operated hospital opened in Chicago? It was um, an actually an integrated hospital was not a segregated hospital. Um, despite the order of the day being segregation in healthcare, this hospital actually served um, poor whites uh, on the south side of Chicago. Okay, so if you, you know your history, maybe some of you who are from Chicago, I lived in Chicago and actually had the, the fortune of, of seeing a lot of the historical archives from this hospital that still exist and meeting some of the folks who keep the foundation for this hospital um, in, the, in the forefront of our consciousness in that region. All right, what do you think? Some of you are Googling, you should be guessing much quicker. Okay, so most of you thought it was 1921. In fact, it's 1891. So Riri, you're in the lead. Um, Provident Hospital and Training School was opened in 1891 by Dr. Daniel Hill Williams and Dr. Emma Reynolds. You can go to this website, um, provfound.org to learn more about it. It was on the south side on 36th Street. Daniel Hill Williams was the first African-American cardiologist, and he actually was the first person to perform open heart surgery. Um, it was an interracial hospital, which again, despite the order of the day being exclusion, we have minority communities welcoming and, um, and, and caring for, for the poor and disenfranchised. Um, he advocated for uh, work uh, in the community and co-founded the National Medical Association because African-Americans were not allowed to join the AMA. We're going to talk more about that. And he was the first um, Black physician to be admitted to the American College of Surgeons. Not to be left off is Emma Ann Reynolds, uh, a Black woman who graduated from an HBCU and dreamed of becoming a nurse. 
Um, there was no program, so she helped found the, the Provident Hospital and Training School, right? A medical school that trained African-American physicians and nurses, um, went on to attend the Women's College of Chicago and earned her MD, and then practiced medicine for years after that. So um, I, I like to point out there's the gender equity uh, of these physicians who are serving um, underserved communities very early on and, and who are pioneering new techniques. Um, and so medicine has really belonged to um, indigenous people, people of color for as long as it has existed. But we sometimes forget about these early pioneers um, from these communities that were forced to start their own programs um, and did so and serve their communities for many years after training. So this is a, an incident that I, I hope that you um, learn from today, how recent it was. Eight Black physician delegates were arrested in front of their colleagues for trying to enter a whites-only dining room where the Fulton County Medical Society, delegates of the American Medical Association were meeting, um, were host, was hosting its national delegates meeting. And what year was this? What year were these eight Black physicians going to a professional meeting that they, of a society they belonged to, um, arrested for trying to sit in a whites-only dining room? What do you think? How long ago was this? It was actually at the Biltmore Hotel. And these, these um, physicians were walking in. Someone said, well, this is a whites only dining room. So these colleagues are not able to join us. And I think they may have thought that people were just going to kind of look the other way. And um, one of the delegates actually brought up the issue. And so um, their colleagues were arrested. So some of you thought it was 51, some 71. It was in fact 1961. Yeah, so Riri still in the lead. Um, discrimination and exclusion are happening via intersecting structures, right? So, so these folks were registered to attend the meeting and then um, were escorted out and, and you know, this is a meeting that they paid for. They're members of, of this delegation and are not allowed to participate in their own profession. The AMA, which is the premier physician um, organization of the day and probably arguably still is, um, did not really enact a lot of policies on, um, on segregation and discrimination. So even despite a lot of things happening in the civil rights movement, there's not a lot going on. So requesting associate membership from the NMA, which many black physicians were members of, they denied that. Um, they wanted to say, okay, you should probably be excluding other medical societies uh, who are discriminating against members. They said, no, we're not going to do that. We're not going to get involved. Um, they said, progress is being made, right? Well, we've come far enough. Uh, lots of people don't want to join the AMA. They don't choose to become members, or we have a lot of people who are members. And um, they said, this is outside of our jurisdiction, right? It's not our problem. It's, this is not the AMA's problem if other medical societies are discriminating against Black physicians. So this very hands-off approach, right? We're not the ones doing it, so we're not going to do anything about it. Despite the civil rights era lasting about a decade in the United States, there are very few mentions of civil rights proceedings in AMA records, meeting notes, conference proceedings, conference sessions. Um, they declined to publish letters about um, the Selma March because it was, quote, controversial. Um, this, this might sound familiar if, if um, you've ever submitted a paper like I have that had some controversial topics and um, it was declined for publication. And they decided not to elect those physicians who were arrested. They said, you know what, it's not ours to get involved. Their statement was, we uphold the law of the land. So in 2008 came an apology, an official apology for the discrimination um, against the NMA. And this happened at one of the meetings. And it was, you know, we unequivocally apologize for our past behavior. We will do everything in our power to right the wrongs done by our organization to African-American physicians and their families and their patients. So this is an acknowledgement by the AMA physician leadership that this racism hurt patients. That's big. Racism kills people. We know that. It's a public health problem. So joining this profession that has these roots and has made these past mistakes is an important consciousness that we all need to bring with us when we enter into these spaces. The AMA founded in 1847, elected its first black woman as president in what year? So what do you think? Founded in 1847, when did the first black woman serve as president of the AMA? Of 
Questions are getting a little harder. Another thing that's important to understand about the AMA is that it excluded a lot of physicians from being able to get hospital privileges because hospitals through intersecting structures required people to be members and said, oh, we only take AMA members to have hospital privileges. So that actually segregated hospitals and practice much more and kept black physicians out of a lot of specialties because they weren't able to get privileges. Okay, most of you think it's 2008 and you're right. 2018, excuse me, 2018. Anon moves into the lead. Okay, so this is Dr. Patrice Harris was elected 171 years later, right? The first female African American to hold that office. So we feel that we're making progress, right? Maybe we're starting to, to move forward and leave behind um, some of these shackles of, uh, of history that have led to discrimination. We've apologized, we're trying to move forward. And then this happened. So I don't know if you're on Twitter or if you saw or you heard about in the news, this podcast that was actually done by um, the AMA. And they actually said that racism wasn't real, that we should stop talking about it, that it is, um, it was a couple of, of white physicians saying, I, you know, discrimination was outlawed in 1964. So why are we still talking about racism? And it caused such a huge outcry that the AMA had to apologize. And this is three months ago. So they issued a statement on the podcast and tweet saying, you know, we're sorry. Um, we know that, it, that racism is real. We're not sure how this even got through. The editor of JAMA was placed on administrative leave. They're going to be making some changes. And so we still have a lot of ways to go to keep these things in our conscientiousness. And clearly we have not reached everyone in terms of understanding the house of medicine that we've all inherited. So I really wanna to emphasize to you that this will be your profession. I want you to commit um, to supporting and um, getting involved in equity and diversity inclusion on your journey right now, not because it looks good on your application, but because this is the house that you will inherit. So this is about listening and speaking up and having difficult conversations like this one, right? And this liberation that I'm talking about is really a two-way process. And I wanna emphasize I tweeted this a couple of weeks ago. You're not free when you're standing on someone else's back, right? Your movement is also impeded. Your ability to grow is also impeded when it's bound up in another person's oppression. So we really need to work on these structures at our school and make sure that we're part of the solution, that we're not the person saying, well, I didn't do that. And that's not my problem. And I'm not the person, you know, who's, who's um, creating this oppression. So liberation is a two-way street, and you'll notice in this graphic that in the liberation slide, if we're the person trying to support these three individuals, when we remove the barriers, we actually see more as well. And so this is what I mean by liberation being a two-way street, is that our view increases, we see more of the game, we see more of what the people we're trying to support see. And that is about liberation, because when we are able to do this, we can show up better for our patients. We can show up better with an understanding of ways that structures are getting in the way of them achieving optimal health outcomes. So again, this is a concept about around fault and responsibility, obligation stewardship, ignoring versus engaging, right? I think we tend to sometimes be the people in the, in, in the top of the boat. Well, I'm sure glad that hole's not on our side, right? But this is our profession. If you came home and this was your dog and this is what your house looked like, you would clean it up, right? If someone left you a property and it got all dilapidated and you owned it, you would clean it up. If you don't do the maintenance on your own car, um, you're going to be the person who has the consequences of the functionality of that car in the future. So although we didn't make these decisions, we didn't discriminate, we weren't the people who did those experiments, we have inherited a profession that was founded on those things. And so we have to be actively on the side of justice as we're moving into medicine in order to make sure um, that we're part of the solution. So these uncomfortable conversations, I recommend this book, Me and White Supremacy. It started out as an Instagram um, challenge, 28-day Instagram challenge, and each chapter is two or three pages. And it really helps us understand some of the terminology and our place, no matter who we are, within these conversations. And so if we talk about racist ideology that's based upon a belief that white people are superior that to people of other races and that they're dominant, I mean, that's really what the history of medicine is founded on, right? So we have to look directly at ways that this ideology has informed medicine and has created the structures that we have today.
So I, I challenge you to look more into this and to not be afraid of having these conversations. Even if the words sort of make you squirm and you don't understand it, it's okay to move forward and, and into these learning spaces. Um, I wanna transition now into talking about demographics of our medical schools in present day. So we know that context impacts performance, right? Inclusion is equitable access to resources so we can thrive and, and reach our full potential. And Dr. Aaron Reeves likes to say that the opposite of inclusion is not exclusion. The opposite of inclusion is incomplete. So who are we missing from the house of medicine that's gonna make us the best profession that we can possibly be? So these things, and we don't have time to go into every single one of them, but some of them may be familiar to you, stereotype threat, belonging is threat, imposter syndrome, discrimination, historical trauma, present day trauma, social justice and racial battle fatigue, and just minoritization and marginalization within our institutions. These things um, impact our performance, impact what it, the difference, five, 10% performance decrements when we feel that we don't belong or we're struggling um, with stereotype threat. So where some people experience their institutions getting all the sunlight and water and nutrients they need, and some people do not, this is really where inclusion um, comes into play within the, the makeup of our medical school classes. So I'm gonna do this, this demographics quiz. This is all data that I've um, pulled from the MSAR. So entering class 2020, um, 154 allopathic schools in the United States and Puerto Rico. Um, students that identified as all or part of a race or ethnicity. So multiple categories are reported in more than one column. The average class size was about 143. And the range for class size was 24 to 365 with a median of about 140. So then I'm going to ask you these questions about representation across these groups. Um, and we're going to we're going to talk a little bit about it. OK, so back to the quiz. Fingers on your buzzers like we're playing Jeopardy, right? How many schools had less than 2% of their class identifying as all or part Latinx? So this is out of 154 schools. How many schools do you think had less than 2% of their class identifying as all or part Latinx? So 2% in an average class size of say 143, right? It's two, three people. How many schools had that as their class makeup for the entering class of 2020? All right, five more seconds. Okay. All right, most of you thought it was 13%. It is actually 5%, so not, a, not as bad as you thought. And there's our leaderboard with Anon. How many schools had less than 4% of their class identifying as all or part of the next? What do you think? 18, 23, 33, or 41, less than 4% of their class. So again, out of a class size average of 140 to 143, right? 10% would be 14 people. So less than 5%, half that, seven, six, something like that. All right, five more seconds. All right, so we're a little mixed on this one, not sure. The answer is 23, okay, 23 schools. So our leaderboard again. How many schools had less than 6% of their class identify as all or part Latinx? 31, 37, 41, or 46? So this is still a really small percentage. So we're talking about out of 154 schools, how many had less than 6%? This is one of those test taking strategies where you have to keep track of the previous question, right? All right, survey says 46. It's a lot, 46 out of 154 schools, almost a third, less than 6%. Okay, there's our leaderboard. So now we're gonna, out of the total schools, how many have less than 17% of students identifying as all or part Latinx in their classes? So 17% is sort of the US population census data estimate for Latinx um, peoples in the United States. 
So how many schools are, are not meeting that population watermark of 17%? And this is out of 154 schools. What do you think? How many have less than 17% of students identified as all or part of Latinx? Here we go. There's the guesses. The answer is 126. It's a lot. It's a lot of schools not meeting the watermark. All right, there's our leaderboard again. So how many schools don't have enough students for a five-person LMSA board, right? So in ratio to just overall percentage, we were talking about percentages of classes, but now we're talking about bodies of people who've identified as all or part Latinx. And I recognize that like the Latinx board or the LMSA board, Latino Medical Student Association board could be people who are not that identified. But just for the sake of illustrating this, let's just assume that each person on the board is someone who identifies as all or part Latinx. So how many schools don't have enough students for a five person LMSA board? So they have four or fewer Latinx students in their entire student body. What do you think? So four or fewer students walking around in the class of 2020. How many out of 154 schools do not have enough for an LMSA board? All right. This is what you all said. And the answer is 17 schools. Yep. Right, there's our leaderboard. Okay, so these are the top 10 schools for Latinx enrollment. You'll see that we have our four schools in Puerto Rico at the very top. Um, I did it by percentage of class and also by total number of students. So, and again, this is available in the MSAR. I just actually scraped the data off of each entry and then did some sorting and, and things like that in, in the spreadsheet. So um, I thought it would just be interesting to share with you guys the top schools. Um, here's, if we exclude the Puerto Rican schools, here's what the top schools look like. And it's notable that the, the four schools in Puerto Rico, Latinx enrollment equals the bottom 62 schools. So the bottom 62 schools out of 150 equal the Puerto Rican schools. So um, we have a long way to go in, in representation here. And you can see a lot of the, um, a lot of the UTs, um, Texas, um, but also Illinois, Miami, Indiana, you're probably wondering who's in the bottom. So I thought, why not? Let's, this is all public data. Let's put it in the bottom. So these are some really appreciably small numbers. And I just want you to think about how hard it might've been to do organic chemistry or physics um, being sort of a first or only an N of one as part of whatever identity groups that you um, share, whether you're parenting or a caregiver or a first gen student, um, Think about these small numbers in, in cohorts that are very large, right? An average class size of 140 um, and, and being um, one of a very small group uh, of students. All right, moving on to another group. Let's talk about um, schools that have zero students identifying as all or part black in the class of 2020. How many schools have zero? We're gonna to have to skip through these faster because I have a lot more slides to do and we're running out of time. So we're gonna skip through these much more quickly. Okay, so this is what everybody is sort of thinking at the moment. And the answer is indeed five. Five schools with no students identifying as all or part black. All right, Ruby at our food board. How many schools have two or fewer students that identify as all or part black? What do you think? Let's see what your answers are. I think you can go ahead and keep voting. Maybe not. Maybe I have to go back. Sorry. Go ahead. <laughs> Schools with two or fewer students. Nine, 13, 17, or 24. All right, here we go. 
answer is 17 schools. 17 out of 154 schools have two or fewer students. That's daunting. That is so daunting. Imagine being one of those students. Um, all right, we're going to do school um, percentage of class now. How many schools have less than 6% of students identifying as all or part black? This is out of 154 schools, remember. So how many have less than 6%? All right. 57, most of you said, and you're right. That is a big number, more than a third of schools that have such a small percentage of their class. All right, and now I'm moving back into the top. How many schools don't have enough students for a five-person LMSA or SNMA board, right? So if we were going to create a student group uh, around identity support uh, for Black students, like SNMA often is, how many schools we wouldn't have with four or fewer people? that identifies all or part black out of 154 schools. How many don't have enough for a five person on the state board? What say you? 23, 30, 34, or 40? All right, we have some pessimists out there. The answer is actually 30. So about one in five schools do not have enough um, folks. All right. So now we're going to look at just the census data population of the 154 schools. How many have less than 12% of students identifying as all or part black in their classes? So there's, you know, a lot of schools are probably not meeting this population watermark. So how many are not meeting it out of 154? I'll give you five more seconds. All right, most of you said 120, and you're right, 120. So about two thirds of the schools. Um, here's the top 10 schools for black enrollment. You'll notice we have our three HBCU medical schools at the very top, um, then by total number of students, and then percentage of the class. Um, top 10 schools minus HBCUs. So the, the HBCUs, the three HBCU medical schools equals 61 schools for black enrollment. So these are the percentages and then these are the raw numbers. Here's the bottom 50 students for black enrollment by number. Unfortunately, my school's on this list, not for long. I just got to my school in October of last year. So I haven't been through one admission cycle yet, but I'm definitely working on pathways programs um, and support programs to focus on some of the structural um, challenges of pre-med preparation to really address that and create more equity within uh, opportunity in medicine. Okay, so we're gonna go through more of these. They're gonna get a little faster. How many schools have less than 6% of students identify as all or part Asian? Three, five, seven, or nine. Less than 6% identifying as all or part Asian. And Rachel said we're going to go a little over, so feel free to stick around um, for the remainder of this. All right, all or part Asian, what do you think? Okay, so most of you said you think it's three schools. It's actually seven schools, okay? So Anon, leaderboard. So Asian American enrollment in the class of 2020, there are seven schools with less than five students for the PAMSA board. There are 20 schools with 12 or fewer students. And there are 11 schools with less than 10% Asian um, students in their classes. So um, we also have to look at distribution um, in addition to representation because our educational experience really is impacted by the, the people who you see that maybe look like you in teaching or, or who are sitting in the classroom next to you. Here are the top 10 schools for Asian enrollment, just for your curiosity. Interesting that there's several Texas schools on here, which I thought was kind of an interesting finding. I'm not sure what the Asian population of Texas is, but definitely 
found that to be um, great. And then uh, I did it by total number of, of students and also by percentage of class. Here are the bottom 30 schools for Asian enrollment by number. I'm not surprisingly the four um, schools in Puerto Rico, um, just because it's and you know mainly Latinx students who are enrolled at those schools because they're located in Puerto Rico. Um, but yeah, so the, these are also really small numbers. So again, we have some some challenges with um, what it feels like to be a student at, at some of these schools based on representation, even for Asian groups that we would you know students might say are overrepresented. Um, how many Asian ethnicities are captured via AMCAS? So it is reported in aggregate, but I actually want to challenge you to think about this in much more disaggregated way because our Asian communities are so different from each other and the diversity within the community is so important. So we tend to report it as sort of this big pan-Asian group, but there are lots of races and ethnicities, sub-ethnicities um, and countries of origin, origin stories within the Asian ethnicity that are important to disaggregate. So how many are allowable as sort of a drop down of the AMCAS, do you think? different ethnicities of Asian. All right, so we really aren't sure across the board. Oh, the winner is 12 now. And that is right, there are 12. So um, here's just a figure from 2018, 2019. This shows you the, the different um, Asian subgroups by academic year of applicants to US medical school. And this is only students who listed alone or multiple Asian subgroups without another group. So if you listed only multiple Asian groups, you're in this as well. So if you listed Asian and white or Asian and black, you're not in this chart. Um, so you can see there's a tremendous amount of diversity um, within our Asian American communities also have healthcare needs, also have cultural challenges, also experience racism in the training environment, right? Again, racism is the risk factor here. So representation alone is not going to solve that. And I think the, the medical students I've worked with, their Asian American descent um, and residents as well, um, still experience racism in their training, which is another reason why we all need to be a part of dismantling some of these structures. So ethnicities of Asia, in case you're curious, um, to be able to look at all of the things that are sort of included in the Asian um, and Pacific Island diaspora. Um, and some of the is, is sort of West Asia is contested because it includes, you know, Qatar and Palestine and Saudi Arabia. But this just sort of also brings in where do these folks fit? Because we often are not counting these folks at all or including them in white which doesn't really capture the lived experience um, or what we're trying to get at when we're talking about, you know, cultural knowledge of serving um, underserved groups. Um, in a study of 115 allopathic medical school deans in 2012, how many were Asian? So this is like the big D dean of the school, right? Like how many folks have led medical schools in that year that were of Asian descent? What do you think? And then this is just sort of getting at leadership and talking about leadership and some of the challenges that we have with inclusion and equity practice within our institutions, not related to representation, but opportunity once you get in, right? Those are different things. Okay, so most of you said three and you are correct, three. Um, so there were three Asian, six black, one Latinx, 105 white, no Native American. I don't believe there's ever been a Native American um, dean of a medical school, and just 16 women. So again, women representing 50% of um, folks applying and getting into medical school, but have not percolated up through the ranks to be deans of medical schools quite the same way um, that men have. So again, representation, equity, have to think about all these things at the same time. So let's move on to white. How many schools had less than 6% of their 2020 class identifies all or part white? What do you think? Remember, it's a, out of 154 schools. So how many identifies all are part white? All right, so this is what you have said. And the answer is in fact, zero. So how many white ethnicities are captured via AMCAS? When you go in and you select white as your race, how many ethnicities are, are able to be sub chosen underneath that category in the AMCAS application? What do you think? Zero, two, four, or 10. Okay, so most people think it's 10. 
The answer is zero. So reclaiming our origin stories and our ethnic heritage is a big part of understanding our place in this work, right? We have to separate the social construction of whiteness. White is a social construction, not a race or a genetic reality, but many heritages have been dissolved into whiteness, like Jews, Irish, Italian. A lot of these immigrants from Europe in the early phases of the United States were not considered white when they came, right? They weren't considered European enough when they came, and yet now are sort of dissolved into that. So I encourage you to think about your origin story and your family heritage and understand your roots and really anchor that as a way of thinking about your place to authentically engage um, in, this, in this work. Um, we're gonna skip this one because uh, we are running out of time. So how many, how many schools have zero students identifying as all or part American Indian or Alaska Native? How many schools have no Native Americans, even all or part identifying, or Alaska Native. What do you think? All right, most of you said 82 schools. It's actually 60 schools. So that's a lot, um, almost half of the 154 that we looked at. How many schools have one student identifying as all or part Native American. So being an N of one, a person, one out of 143 on average would be your experience if this is your demographic and representation. And remember, schools that trained indigenous healers closed. They were not able to be accredited. College was not accessible to many indigenous people in 1910. So their avenues to becoming physicians as part of the profession closed, even though much of medicine was pioneered by um, indigenous traditions and practices. Pharmaceutical um, industries built on plant-based extractions of, of healing, right? And, and those are indigenous um, practices and ideas. All right, so here's what you said. How many, how many schools have just one? 39. That's a lot. The highest percentage of students in a 2020 entering class identifying as all or part Native American or Alaska Native is what? So what is the highest percentage? So of all the schools, what is the highest percentage of Native American students out there demographically in any one school? What do you think? And this is an extremely underrepresented group and underserved group. And we could talk about the history of genocide for indigenous people in the United States, uh, which we don't really learn about, but the Indian boarding school movement, the Indian Removal Act, all the treaties that have been broken, all these structures and injustices have certainly led to Native Americans and Alaska Natives have some, having some of the most um, egregious and, and disparate health outcomes and, and indicators of well-being in the United States. Okay, so most of you think it's 5%. It's actually 9%. It's a smaller school, University of North Dakota. I will show you um, what that looks like. So how many schools don't have enough students for an ANAMS board? So how many students have four or fewer students identifying as all or part Native American or Alaska Native? And ANAMS, in case you haven't heard of it, is the Association of Native American Medical Students. It is a subgroup, student group of the Association of American Indian Physicians. You can learn a lot more about um, indigenous folks in medicine. If you go to aaip.org, I do encourage you to explore and, and learn a little bit more about this profession that you're going into and who's a part of it, who's been excluded and invited um, in the past and present day. All right, so there's our answers, tie between 137 and 144. It's in fact 137 schools. All right, so Anon, you're our quiz leader. Great job. Um, there's our top five. Um, appreciate your engagement. Here are the top native um, schools by enrollment and number. So I put the enrollment um, here and then the percentage in parentheses. So you can kind of see Midwest and West um, kind of lead the way. There are a few in Florida um, as well, and actually our HBCUs, um, again, um, really showcasing the, the excellence, inclusive excellence for our HBCUs in that regard. Um, so medians and averages by race, just to sort of show you across each of these different groups. Um, the, these are really very small numbers, right? So if we have an average class size and we're looking at sort of how many people identify as this, we don't have a great distribution um, across our schools for this. So there are some structural realities within healthcare and medicine that lead to these differences. 
And you're going to notice when, as you get into medicine, or maybe you already have, that we have diversity offices and programs. Um, we're trying to work on issues such as cultural barriers and language barriers. I want to encourage you to think about representation versus, um, versus health, right? So many of our, our communities, such as those that come from the Asian and Pacific Islander diaspora, are not necessarily underrepresented. We may not actually know because we don't disaggregate them, but they certainly have um, communities that are underserved. Immigrant communities that have cultural barriers, language barriers, structural barriers like poverty um, and health inequality that uh, create challenges to health and overall well-being. So Ibram Kendi, if you've read How to Be an Anti-Racist, another one that I recommend, talks about space racism and racialized spaces, right? So that lead to resource inequality. Who does this space belong to and who feels welcome in this space? And um, we often call space within our institutions sort of by default white space. And so then everyone else has to sort of carve out space um, for, for their group. So we have to be really conscientious of this as we're moving into student organizations um, and into medical school. We need integrated and protected spaces, right? So, so we need sort of the general spaces, but also protected spaces where the identity intersections that we have challenges with get, uh, get some, some safe harbor. We can talk about what's it like to be a parent in medical school? What's it like to be a first gen student? What's it like, gosh, you were, you were an engineering major too? Me too, I'm having a really hard time adjusting, right? So we need these spaces both in, to think about things that we share, but also to think about intersections that need uh, a small corner where folks who, who have similar intersections and experiences can talk about those things. Collaboration within and between always. And I encourage you to pursue leadership and be one of these people that really understands the nature and importance of integrated and protected spaces. Again, protected spaces are things like for cancer survivors, right? I'm not mad that I didn't get invited to the cancer survivor group because I'm not a cancer survivor. And I recognize that folks who've had that walk need a protected space where they can share unique things um, inherent to having had that um, experience. Same thing with veteran support or women in medicine or first-gen students, right? Protected spaces and integrated spaces are a big part of how we do equity practice in our institutions. And um, if you feel excluded by protected space, I invite you to really think about why. But there are plenty of integrated spaces where we are all welcome to bring our best selves to the table and roll up our sleeves and get to work. So I really want you to understand this one thing. Another group's protected space does not oppress you. So we have to think about, again, the context that I just gave you. Why are these spaces needed in the first place? The history of medicine should give you some context as to why it's so important that we have these spaces, what it feels like to be that one student, two students, the students in the class that don't have enough to even start a student organization to create protected space for folks who have an identity walk similar to their own coming into medicine. Um, again, if you feel oppressed by protected space, um, really get curious about that and dig into your own um, defensiveness and thought process around that so that you can come through it um, as an ally and a person who, who champions um, integrated spaces where we work together, but also protected spaces that folks might need in order to thrive within our institutions. You're going to need your truth, love, and commitment to do this work, as Dr. Saad says. We have to get vulnerable. We have to be willing to look at some hard truths and face up to racism, racist ideas, the hidden racism that's within even some of the structures um, of, of sort of how things work, um, a commitment to recognition. We're not immune from this. None of us are immune. And so we're all susceptible to these systems because we've joined a profession that has these things baked in, right? So similar to how, you know, none of us are painting our houses with lead paint anymore. Uh, we might buy a house where there's actually lead paint that's been used at some point or another. And we have to be responsible for eradicating that to keep everyone safe. I really um, enjoy Abby Wambach's um, podcast. It's on Dare to Lead. If you listen to Brene Brown, Dare to Lead on Spotify, that's my shameless plug for one of my favorite podcasts. But she has one on new rules of leadership. And she talks about these three things that we can do when we face failure, or when something is disconnected from our values, right? We fall short. We can shame, blame, or claim. And I want to encourage you in this moment as you're thinking about your development as a pre-med student, don't withdraw, ignore, avoid, or pity folks, or feel superior, or also feel that you're not enough. That shame is not helpful in moving justice forward. We also don't wanna blame people who did this before or get angry or point fingers or slip into helplessness, right? If you are a person who's experiencing exclusion at your institution, um, try to think about claiming the parts of it 
um, that you can control and also really having honest conversations with classmates to help them understand um, what this experience is like for you. That burden is very real. And so if you're a classmate that's being, that's being, um, that has stories and truths shared with you, I encourage you to step up and to listen and to get vulnerable and to create and make that change. So I wanna to know today if there's any commitments that you're willing to make to advance representation, equity practice, and inclusive excellence in medical education. As you think about your journey now as a pre-med student and moving forward, what could you do? What could you do to advance this? And you know, we're getting really close to time, so I won't leave this up, but I do want to leave that with you and, and have you reflect on it. I hope I've inspired you today to join the House of Medicine and be part of the solution, be part of these powerful and necessary and vulnerable conversations to be thinking about race and place and the history of medicine um, and moving it forward. And I will say that the students I'm working with today are courageous and they push and they make our faculty uncomfortable. And it's wonderful. It's wonderful to see the growth and the change that is coming um, as we begin to recognize ways that we can all be part of these solutions. Dr. Sunny Nakai, that was so amazing. Um, let me leave some of that screen up so people can continue to see those tweets. Uh, I loved that. I could tell by the chat how much they loved it, partly because there was engagement and partly because there was a whole lot of silence, which means they're listening, not talking amongst themselves. Like <laughs> instead of typing, they were in Slido doing certain polls. Um, so I, uh, I knew a lot of that. I didn't know it all. It's still eye opening. I'm doing a lot of work myself in this area. So I just, I'd love to continue to educate. And I think uh, a lot of people are really grateful for you opening eyes or reiterating what needs to be heard. And I know I am. Um, and uh, yeah, I want to make sure everyone knows where to find you. It's on the slide. I've also been showing it a little bit from banners, but you can follow Dr. Nakai um, on her YouTube channel or on Instagram. And then she's got this amazing book, Pre-Med Prep, Advice for Medical Schools Admissions Dean. You can buy it through Rutgers Press, um, Barnes & Noble, Amazon. Um, all of Sunny's links are on nationalpremedday.com. So if you go there, go to her speaker bio, we put it all in one place. So obviously this slide you're looking at is not clickable. If you're looking for clickable links, it's all there for you on National Pre-Med Day. Uh, thank you so much for your time and energy and dedication. Uh, it was just a thrill to have you here today. Thank you so much for having me and I appreciate the engagement. I know it's a tough topic. And when we were planning this, Rachel, we were like, you know what, we're going to go for it. We're going to go for it. And I appreciate MAPT and National Pre-Med Day's attention to these really important topics. And, and hopefully we've all grown a little bit through this discomfort. I hope so. Thank you so much.